Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cisco Optics Podcast, where we talk about pluggable optics for networks. Single-mode fiber transformed telecommunications in the 1970s and 1980s by raising the ceiling for communication bandwidth over transoceanic distances. It took years of R&D to get there, though. Remember, we're sending light through tens of kilometers of glass without regeneration. I mean, imagine how pure the glass of an 80-kilometer thick window needs to be in order to see through it. This is episode 48, and we continue our conversation with Rasheen McCool, expert in fiber networks for telecommunications and scientific instrumentation at Corning Optical Communications. We continue with fiber density and bend resilience. Rasheen McCool is a senior market and technology development manager for Corning Optical Fiber and Cable, specializing in single mode fiber and access networks. She provides technical and market insight for Corning's global fiber and cable product line management teams. Rasheen has 30 years of experience in engineering and optical communication systems and subsystems, including many years designing networks for advanced radio telescopes. Rasheen has held project management and coordination lead roles in diverse teams throughout her career. Rasheen is the acting chair of the Women in Fiber Committee for the FTTH Council Europe and is the winner of the Corning Optical Communications You Make a Difference Award 2022 for her leadership of diversity initiatives in Corning. Rasheen holds a master's degree in electrical and electronic engineering from the University of Nottingham, United Kingdom, and is a chartered member of the Institute of Engineering and Technology. And now join me as I talk with Rasheen McCool. When it's in highly dense cables, we can still maintain you know, the um, low loss that we expect from single mode fiber. Okay, let me see if I can unpack this. So the fiber itself, you don't want to change the properties compared to the standard single mode fiber. So you change the, you reduce the outer diameter and that we allows for more space. We do both. Oh, okay. So we change, we, we create a bend resilient fiber. Mm -hmm. and we reduce its outer diameter and then you have a fiber which is ideal for dense dense cables because okay. it, it it's more resilient to the micro bend and also you're reducing the amount of space it's taking up in the cable so when you reduce the outer diameter are you maintaining the density of the cable and filling up that extra space with some soft for material or something no it allows us or... to go smaller it allows us to get a lower outer diameter cable ah okay yeah okay so, so same so number that... of fibers in the cable cable but the, the overall cable diameter is also reduced as you reduce the fiber yeah outer diameter. Uh, so I, I, yeah okay. i need to say this which is really what is the definition of density why would you need density right so okay. Um, density means two things in practice in cables. First of all, it means you can have more fibers in the same outer diameter cable. That's one thing you can do. You can, you can take the cable that you use today and for the same outer diameter get more fibers in it. The other definition of density is that you can take the same fiber count and make a smaller cable. And okay. that could be important if you're trying to drop down a duct size. So, so if you're trying to extend out into the network and maybe as you extend out into the networks, the ducts get smaller, but you want to put the same amount of fiber in, well, that all density helps with that as well. Okay. Okay, so there are two ways, th those are the two categories of ways to to increase your density yeah 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 and it's doing the same thing you're basically getting more fibers per mill millimeter squared okay but to do that and you need these you need these fibers that have this bend resilience and low outer diameter right okay so you, so you're doing it with both uh approaches the actual glass design yeah and then and then the the dimensions of the yeah of the fiber yeah so how has this been um 
So what kind of impact has have you seen because of this increased density? What do you see any uh is this widely deployed now? Is this a common practice? Or is it taking off at this point? How, like how new is this? It's it's a trend that's been increasing over the years. Um, I've, I've seen it increasing. So so it, it definitely is getting more traction and it is being installed um, both in the US and, and in EMEA as well. Um, the very, very highest density cables that Corning Cell are our mini extend cables and they it has an impact on the installation schemes because they are fibers that are cables that are installed in subducts. So um there are advantages with that in terms of um in terms of speed of installation because you can blow the cables through these subducts. Uh, but we do have like mm. really highly dense cables that are pulled in the way that you know traditional cables are um that are pulled on a rope through through duct um and i think i would say i, I cannot think i'm sure there are applications but off the top of my head i can't think of many applications where we're not trying to get more fibers in the same duct size or the same amount of fibers in a smaller duct size. I think it's, a, it's a, I mean, obviously on the drop cables and stuff like that, and that's an obvious place where that's not necessarily changing, but everything is miniaturizing now. Um, and and it's, it's associated with density, but also about sustainability as well, because you're using less materials. Mm. The smaller uh, the cables okay. are, the less transport costs there is, the easier they are to handle. You know, all of that matters. Okay. I didn't think of that. So, I mean, we think of these cables as being very small, but they, they can be really, really long, right? And so... Yeah. It's actually quite a bit of material once you accumulate over these yeah. Yeah. distances. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And of course everybody's concerned about transport and you know the the impact that we're having, um, the, the sort of carbon footprint that we that our products have and that the installation has, etc. Uh so okay, so this is a trend. Uh are there any other trends that are that are happening right now in, in fiber? Um, I think, uh, so one of the trends that I think that we, we're seeing aside from density is this proliferation of endpoints. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, we're seeing more and more things getting connected to fiber. Um, more homes being connected directly to fiber, but also okay. the trend on, you know, 5G. So one of the really interesting things about, um, about fiber is that in the mobile networks, they're actually, because of 5G and because of the increase in bandwidth, those networks are becoming fiber fiber connected right and mm -hmm. um, so we see a lot of fiber going into those mobile networks and then of course uh, with the internet of things whilst not all of those things are being connected by fiber uh, they're all going onto wireless mobile networks and that data is then being transmitted by fiber so I mean, I think people right. would be quite astounded by the amount of fiber that's in their mobile network. Um, and that then has to go somewhere. And of course, that goes into the data centers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, aspects of data center location, like latency, um, like just the physical size of things and the amount of power 
that is required. That means those data centers are kind of distributed a little bit more. Um, mm. So I would say that that is, is, you know, you've heard of the edge data center. I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but there's certainly more mm. of a distribution. Um, and then in long haul networks, those capacities are just really, really going up. And as we're talking about the future, I guess we should talk about some of the future fibers. Yeah, I a couple come to mind, but I'll, I'll let you, yeah. I'll let you name them. So um, there's another. There are some really exciting developments on kind of almost fundamentally changing the fiber, if you like. So um, right now, I. I I've been talking about fiber counts and cables, but in the future, we might be talking about the number of cores in cables because there are multi core fibers that are, uh, they're a focus of research, I would say, um, in which you have the normal fiber, so the standard fiber, um, but within that fiber, you've got four or eight or you know two however many cores within that fiber so you're multiplying the number of transmission pathways in a single fiber and that's called multi-core so, fiber uh, and that's a really active area of research right now so whereas the the current standard is a single core fiber with one core in the center yeah and now you're saying in the same cladding instead you have multiple cores and and they're just consuming more more uh cross-sectional space within the the cladding yeah yeah so yeah so they this sounds they, like the ultimate in density then indeed well you can yes you can multiply the density by the number of cores that you can fit into the fiber yeah so what are the uh what are the uh the current challenges that are being tackled right now with multi-core? I think there are, there are a number of challenges. Um, obviously, there's just the sheer uh, challenge of, of making a fiber like that, right? Of, of uh, making sure that those cores are aligned, that they're consistent, that uh, the the manufacturing thresholds and variances um, are within tolerance, but the other aspect of it is the ecosystem. So, the ability to to take that fiber and connect it to something, right? If you think about, mm. you know, Cisco, I, you know, me. The Corning lady arrives at Cisco, and you, the Cisco guy, have two receivers, and you want to plug it into my multi-core mm -hmm. fiber. Well, you need two cores, right? And I've only got one yeah. multi-core yeah. fiber, so you gotta the, have, somehow get the light from the fiber into the into exactly. the transceiver, yeah, and so, vice versa. So that's that's right now. That's that's um, uh, using components called fan outs. Um, and so um, that that whole ecosystem on how you connect to multiple fibers needs to be developed, how you splice multiple fibers, you know, um, how you amplify multiple fibers, uh, all of that has to be mm. worked through. And of course, you know, developing ecosystems takes takes time. I think one of the things that has been an area of research is if if you put multiple cores into a fiber what happens to the light in that fiber and how does it interact with each other so how far away do the cores have to be from one another mm. in order that you don't get negative um you know, negative impact on the transmission. That's that's, that's an example. Or... Um, 
So, you know, and what is the best profile to put in those in those fibers? So so all of that, I think, um, you know, that's that's an area of active research. And I think it's got to be worked out. OK. Do you know if people are working on like any mechanical issues? Just like That was the fifth part of my conversation with Rasheen McCool. Next time, we'll get into mechanical considerations and the quality architecture of fiber manufacturing. Hey, we have a new website. It's optics.podcastpage.io. That's optics.podcastpage.io. You can either listen there or use the same podcast platform you've been using all along. Please subscribe. Better yet, leave a review, especially if you use Apple Podcasts. Remember, we're part of the Cisco Podcast Network where you can find other great Cisco podcasts too. We also have educational videos on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com and search on Cisco Optics. Thank you for listening. This is Pat Chow, Product Manager at Cisco Optics. The next episode is part six of my conversation with Rasheen McCool. Until next time.